Hello, welcome to Langway Camp uh, in the middle of uh, Vindu National Park in Gabon. Um, this is our camp. And we have Dubai about three kilometers down to the east. So behind us is the office um, and we also have a kitchen um, with a gas cooker and a dining room. This is one of our sheltered platforms for the tents. Um, we've just recently treated it for termites around the bottom. Um, and soon we'll, we'll treat all the rest of the wood as well because the termites are quite a problem here. You've got a lot of humidity and with this wood touching the ground it's, it's very attractive for the termite. So this has been my house for the last uh, just over a year. Uh, a lovely big tent which is more like a marquee and inside I have a double bed so it's not really rough in it, it's quite luxurious camping. Before I arrived and for the first couple of months I was here for power we had to use a generator which in a place like this is quite unpleasant because it's very noisy and it only runs for an hour to a day and for all of the fuel we had to carry it in by hand so we'll be walking up and down from the Boodle of Peace with uh, jerry cans for the fuel um, for running the stuff in the evening to charge computers. We have here our solar panels, which are connected to these batteries. And inside is a charge controller and an inverter. The panels that give us power um, is actually a bit more than we need really. We, we never get low on, on electricity. Um, it'd be nice one day to pop these on top of the roof and get them out of the way because they're not the most attractive things in the, the middle of the camp here. Whilst the project was shut down for a few years, um, unfortunately a mouse moved into this box here and made itself at home in all the wiring and chewed things up and disconnected wires and snapped them in half and all this sort of thing. So one of the first things I did was to replace all that wiring uh, replace a few of the breakers that are broken, um, reinstall the, the lightning arrester and after that we were able to individually charge each battery and repair them and then reconnect the, pan the solar panels, the battery and the charge controller and this now provides all our power in camp. So with this we can charge our computers, we can charge our, our batteries for our GPS's and for phones and all this sort of thing and that runs 24-7 and doesn't make too much noise uh, it's very self-sufficient and eco-friendly um, and we have lights and we can, uh, yeah, we can eat our food in the light rather than have to do it by the light of head torches which is what we did for the first few months. So communication here is quite difficult, obviously there's no phone reception this far away from civilization. Um, we used to rely on just the satellite phones but they're fairly unreliable and very expensive. So after I fixed up the, um, the solar power, I repaired the antenna which is outside and we can now use this HF radio to talk between here and a window of the logistics space uh, and organise movements and supplies of food and all this sort of thing. And that's free and it doesn't cost anything, so it's good. We do a segment for the Grand C. Oui, c'est ça. On a besoin de, de sel aussi, un paquet de sel. Oui, un paquet de sel aussi, oui. C'est tout? Ah, ok, c'est tout. So in the next month or so, we're going to be using this wood and some more wood that's stuck in another tent site up there to uh, rebuild a shower and a water tower um, and various other repairs around camp. At the moment, we're washing a stream, which is just over here, which is quite nice, but it's not awfully ecological because the stream eventually arrives at the bay. So any, any pathogens, any soap, anything like that that we dump into the water eventually reaches down there. It's probably filtered by quite a distance of stream, but it's still not a good thing to be doing. So with a water tower and a shower, the, the soil will filter out anything that gets dropped in the water before it reaches the river. 
and the water tower will give us running water so we can have running water in the kitchen and we can have a shower and all this sort of thing so that'd be quite quite high tech. So down at the bay at the moment we've got a horrible tarpaulin just lying across some, some planks so every time it rains you've got to pack all our optics away and all our cameras and all our lenses and stuff because it's not very safe and obviously it rains quite a lot here so that doesn't really work so we're going to put a nice apex roof on this is going to be a kume we're going to have some nice onduline sheets to go on top and then up at the camp First of all, we're going to put up the uh, the water tower, and then from the water tower we can connect the shower and the kitchen. At the moment, we wash in a stream, which isn't the best solution because that water eventually goes down to the bay. So to reduce our impact as much as possible, we have a, a composting toilet. Um, anything that goes into there after six months or so is broken down and just kind of like a, a peaty soil that can then be uh, put out onto the side it doesn't smell and it doesn't contain any pathogens that gets killed off by the heat so rather than having to dig lots of long drops or uh, anything like that we can we can use this one okay mercy bonsoir oui demain je le piche for the work here the, the biggest problem is is just the logistics it's it's remote um, there's no road access it's in the middle of nowhere so anything we want to bring in First has to travel by about for about two hours by car and then gets left at the Boudoula piece at the end of the road in the forest and then after that we have to hike with it for another two hours. So for everything from gas bottles for the cooker, which weigh quite a lot, we have to carry that on our backs. Uh, any kind of equipment, any kind of tools, anything like that has to be brought in from a Vindu. And even at a Vindu it's not very easy, there's no road access to a Vindu itself. Either everything has to come on the trains, which aren't very reliable, uh, or they have to come to one side of the, the Vindu river and then they have to be walked across a railway bridge to the other side of the Avindu River and then picked up by a second car and brought back to the village. So by far the biggest problem really is just the fact it's a, a difficult site to work at. Over here that's the bridge that you crossed there. And then we drove down here to the village, we slept there last night. And then this morning the drive takes us up along here. And that's the 30k diversion that I was talking about. There used to be the path along here, but that's now broken so we can't drive along there. So we do this diversion up to here and we carry along and this is Camp Dilo and then this is the buffer zone of the park in light green here and eventually we arrive on the, on the edge of the park and that's the elephant bridge and we carry on up to here and that's 75 kilometers in total and then from there we get out of the car and we load up our backpacks and we walk the final about eight kilometers into camp which is here and then from camp we do another three kilometres along this path down to the Bai. The reason we're here really is Langway Bai, which is a very important clearing for all sorts of species, but especially elephants. Uh, you can have huge number of elephants at any one time. You can have up to sort of 78 individuals in the daytime um, and probably more at night, but we're not quite sure how, exactly how many at night because it's, it's quite difficult to, to count them when it's dark. Partly as, a, as just a presence, if there's a presence here it will discourage other people from, from coming into, the, into this area and poaching. Um, Bai is unfortunately a very easy place to poach because the animals come to you so you can sit in the, in the, uh, in the border with a, a gun and just wait for things to come to you so that's not brilliant. In terms 
terms of monitoring, when we're monitoring the population of elephants and other species, we can begin to detect changes in the population. And if we find, for example, that uh, the number of large tusk males is declining year on year, that can be an indication of poaching. You know, have the larger tusks and they're, yeah, they're more likely to be poached. Um, so that's one aspect. And other aspects is things like uh, the health of the population. With gorillas, we've noticed recently that there's a, a skin condition, which we think is yours, which is a kind of syphilis. Um, and affects gorillas and mostly uh, silverbacks and uh, adults. We're monitoring uh, every every time the a group comes into the bio, we, we assess how, how many individuals are infected, uh, the extent of their infection, um, whether it seems to be causing them any problem with feeding or anything like that. And then with the data, we can detect whether there's uh, a reduction in reproductivity or an increased mortality in different individuals. In the forest, we have a few other little projects as well. Um, until recently, we've been doing phenology, which is uh, the monitoring of kind of uh, the cycles of um, plant growth and plant reproduction. So when things flower, when they fruit, um, when they come into leaf, and all this sort of thing. And with that data, we can use that along with the elephant data and the gorilla data to partly explain um, why and when animals visit the bay, uh, and partly to assess things like um, the effect of climate change. You know. If things start flowering earlier or flowering later or, or coming into leaf earlier or later, then it's an indication that something is changing. Other things we do here around the camp, we survey for invasive species. Um, Wasmania is quite a big problem in Gabon. Um, it originally came from South America and it was mostly brought in by uh, exploitation, so logging and uh, oil exploration, all this sort of thing. Where you find Wasmania, you typically don't find any other ant species because the Wasmania either outcompete them or, or eat them. Um, so that's not something we want to do, and that has a huge knock on effects. It doesn't sound like a big problem if you've just got a different kind of ant, but uh, everything feeds back. So you, these ants affect the insects and the invertebrates, and that feeds up to the, the next sort of level and the bird species and all this sort of thing. So it's quite a big problem. And obviously, we don't want to introduce anything that shouldn't be here ourselves. So we monitor for the presence of. For example, Wasmania, we have um, sticks dipped in peanut butter, which are left around the edge of the camp and checked every so often to see what species of ant are, are feeding on them. So we obviously want to reduce our impact as much as possible whilst we're here. So we're going to go and look at an atanga tree, which is Bretonneri, uh, Dacroides Bretonneri. It's a very tasty fruit. And then we're going to go up to the top of the hill and have a look at a camera trap and see if there's anything caught on the card. These are atanga, but they're a little bit old now. This is a camera trap. It takes these big batteries. This is actually quite an old one, but back in the day it was quite a good one for being old, so it's still quite good quality. This is a infrared LEDs. We've got the sensor in here and the camera lens here. So when an animal crosses a path or comes along this path, it will uh, snap a photo. So that was about 40 meters from the camp, about 10:30 at night. That's the elephant having a go at the camera. She comes in, notices it, has a little sniff. That's probably the inside of his trunk. It backs off a bit, decides to head off in another direction. Ah, oh, there's his little, little sister. That's a quite an unusual one, really, really pale. Probably a, a, an old male. Just got that shot. That's a... Uh, Golden cat, shut the other day. And lots of bikers up there. That's the cephalof adojone, adojone, yellowback diker. That's a little blue diker. Another blue diker. So, the third kind of monitoring we do at the bay is something called systematic scan sampling where every, every certain period of time we use 30 minutes. Um, the number of animals from six focal species are counted when they're in the bay. 
So for example at 8.30 we'll count 15 elephants and 10 gorillas and 20 sisatunga. And that's repeated every 30 minutes throughout the day, every single day that we're there doing monitoring. There's a lot you can learn from that. Um, you can learn about the, the frequentation of the bi of the, of the bi by these various species. You know what time of year they come, whether it's during the rainy season, whether it's during the dark dry season. In combination with the phenology data, you can work out if they're coming to feed on a certain kind of plant, or if they're, if they're coming because there isn't very much other fruit available in the forest. And also, it's quite important for um, tourism. If you if you don't know what animals to expect at a bar, you can't you can't guarantee somebody. Oh yeah, you're going to see elephants. Yeah, you're going to see sitatunga. Whereas if you know uh, if you know how they use the bar and at what period they are likely to come, you can say well, 70% chance of seeing it. Um, and don't come during this other time of year when there's not very much visiting the bar. Other projects for the future. Um, there's a few things that we want to get done. Um, a lot of which depends on funding, but if we if we can find the funding for it, there's a few things we want to do. One of them is to extend the camera trapping network. Um, at the moment, we've just got a few cameras just here and there in the forest, nothing very systematic. But if we receive the funding, um, we would buy maybe 30 camera traps and put them around the south of, of Indian National Park systematically and in places where we think we're likely to find signs of poaching um, and other kind of intrusion into the park. Um, and when, with that, we can assess uh, changes in population. You can um, index abundance and, and uh, animal density by using the camera trap data. Um, and then at the same time, we're putting out these camera traps. We can be doing uh, they're called recce walks, which is kind of a, a systematic way of moving through the forest, recording signs of animals in terms of dung and feeding signs, and also signs of humans. So things like machete cuts or footprints or uh, shotgun casings or carcasses, anything like this. The second project that we're thinking about doing, if we can get the funding, is a chimp habituation program um, up in the north of the park towards a place called Nasuna, which was an old forestry station. Um, people from WCS have reported finding naive chimps. Um, with great apes it's normally very, very difficult to do a habituation program because they're quite intelligent animals and it takes a very long time. So, for example, for a gorilla habituation project it could take up to 10 years. So it's something you really have to think about and how to be committed to. And with these chimps, if they're naive, it means you don't have to overcome their initial fear of human beings before you can begin the habituation. So rather than having to spend five years proving that you're not poachers and proving that you're not there to damage their, their group, um, you can move straight in and their natural curiosity will draw them to you slightly. And then after that, you can begin to habituate them. And then eventually that will be handed over to AMPN as a kind of tourism product. At the moment, Langway Bay is probably the best place in Gabon to see uh, wild gorillas. Um, and you can see them fairly regularly, you know, sort of every other day they come into the bay. But chimpanzees don't visit bays, um, and so the only way to see them really is in the forest. And if they're wild populations, it's very, very difficult to follow them. If it was a habituated population, you could sort of guarantee a, a tourist could come and see the, the chimpanzees somewhere wild in the forest. It was a little cicada, well, a big cicada. We found it in the stream by Langway Bar, uh, by Langway Camp.